sports. Ladies and gentlemen, please all rise as we, as a field, bestow upon Judge Nathan Dill the NADCP Governor of the Year Award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judge Lawrence, thank you for not only your very generous introduction, but also your pioneer spirit as you have continued to lead uh, drug and DUI courts in the state of Georgia. I accept this award on an individual basis. My wife Sandra and I are honored to be with you here today. Uh, we are also honored to have uh, our son who is also a drug court judge in two of the superior courts in the state of Georgia who is here as a part of your conference. But I also want to accept this award for three different categories of people. The first are those of you who are represented here and your colleagues scattered across this country. The DUI courts, the drug courts, the mental health courts, the veterans courts, the family courts, the judges and the staff and those who make their jobs possible and produce the results that we have all heard and are very proud of here today. So on all of your behalf, I accept this award and give yourselves a hand for being a part of that. As Judge Lawrence indicated, my goal is to have a, an accountability court and in many instances several variations of accountability courts in all 159 counties of the state of Georgia. That is an achievable goal. It's one we will achieve. The second group that I accept this award on behalf of are the members of our Georgia General Assembly. Now you know when I first came up with the idea that Georgia needed criminal justice reform, some people said, well, that's just not something that is going to be very popular. And it's certainly not going to be very popular for a Republican governor to advocate that. Well, let me tell you what happened. The first thing I did was to appoint a criminal justice reform commission. I knew that we had a problem. We were the 10th largest population state, but we had the fourth largest prison population. And just to be honest with you folks, I didn't think Georgians were that much meaner than the rest of you. <laughs> I asked them, why is that happening? And they came back with a rather simple answer. You are incarcerating too many people who by your own definition are classified as nonviolent. And that is the category that can best be served through accountability courts. We already had some accountability courts in our state, but with that recommendation, we went to the General Assembly that first year with the recommendation that we largely expand and fund more of these accountability courts, drug courts, DUI courts, et cetera. Now, even though it was something that some had predicted we would have difficulty achieving, the General Assembly of our state passed that first piece of legislation unanimously. Not a single dissenting vote. The second year, we came back with the second leg of the stool, and that was juvenile justice reform. And the argument was on several levels. One was, if you want to take it on a purely financial level, the $18,000 per year which it cost us to keep an adult incarcerated rises to almost $90,000 for the incarceration of a juvenile for a year's period of time. And the results were not anything that anybody could be proud of. We were having one out of every three adults who were paroled from our prison system return within three years or less. In our juvenile system, it was even worse. One out of every two who were out of the system were back in the system within three years or less. And many times they came back as adult offenders. So on all of those counts, it was not working. The second year, 
the General Assembly, when they were asked to consider juvenile justice reform, once again passed that reform legislation unanimously. <clears throat> this past session was the third leg of the stool. It is perhaps the most difficult but it is also a necessary part of making the system work. And that is what we call transition, support, and reentry. It is the allowance of those individuals who are leaving our prison system to transition back into our society and hopefully be more successful in the process. Now we recognize that we can do some things on the inside of our system and we are doing that. We did a survey of our inmate population in our prisons and we found that almost 70% of them did not have a high school diploma or a GED. Now, if someone serves a felony sentence and still does not have those basic educational requirements and you send them back home, and that's where they generally go, by the way, is back to the same community where they got in trouble in the first place, what do you think their opportunity for success is gonna be? Not very good. We have just hired, and he will start work on the 1st of July, or beginning of our fiscal year. One of the best school superintendents in the state of Georgia will become an assistant commissioner within our Department of Corrections charged with education and training. And you're going to hear more about Georgia on that front as well. I wish I could tell you that the third leg passed unanimously. But it didn't. We had two dissenting votes in the House out of 180 members. I just thought about it today, as a matter of fact. We had our primary less than 10 days ago, and both of those fellows were defeated in their own primary. <laughs> you know, sometimes it pays to be on the right side of history. The third group that I accept this honor on behalf of are some of the ones that you have heard from here today with your parade of transformation. Now, as I said, our son is a drug court judge. He talked me into coming and speaking at drug court graduations. I think I've done it twice. I've told him I'm not coming back. I have too tender a heart. I can't take it. The stories of redemption, of family reunification, of reclaiming lives, of giving hope where there was no hope. They get to me. And yet, I travel all the way from the state of Georgia to California, and you put me through it again today. <laughs> but I accept this on behalf of those who are the participants in our accountability court system. And the reason I do that is because it is not easy on their part. We call them accountability courts because it does hold people accountable for their actions. But not only does it hold them accountable, it gives them the support that they need to be able to be held accountable. And that's where all of you come in. Now, Sandra goes shopping every once in a while, and I tag along with her. And we had the phenomenon as we started going into various stores, we had people that would come up to us and they would say, and they were all excited. They said, well, we know your son. I'm in his drug court. And I'd look around and I would think, I wouldn't have said it that loud if I were you. And it kept happening. And I suddenly realized, they were proud of themselves. They were proud to be in drug court. They were proud to have graduated from drug court. And the theme that was repeated in almost every one of those encounters was, drug court saved my 
life. So on the behalf of those, I accept this honor. Keep saving the lives of those who are willing to be held accountable. It will make a difference in every state in this union. Thank you.